Cool, so I'm Charlie, we'll start with the basics. Hi. Um, you might know me from the internet. Uh, you can find me on GitHub or Twitter with these things. Uh, as Julian mentioned, I am the engineering director for the UX platform team at GoDaddy. Um, we are responsible for all of the cross-cutting user experience things that you see on any GoDaddy product. Uh, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is grown out of lessons learned of running a user experience platform for 50 product teams that you don't have to interact with on a daily basis. Um, I'm also a board member at the Node.js Foundation and I was previously the founder at Node.jitsu. Uh, but getting back to the problem, what are serverless front-end deployments? And the best way to start talking about that problem is to talk about what are deployments. So this exists about six hours west of here in a place called Marfa, Texas. This is actually a Prada store, actually in Marfa, Texas, actually involved in the act of serving, right? Deployment is all about serving new functionalities to your visitors. Now, most Node.js front ends work in the following way. You have some code asset that you've written, probably your React or Angular or you know, whatever jQuery app that exists somewhere. And you push that onto your server, and that is co-located with the actual server, right? So if anybody knows what I'm talking about, they've probably seen things that look like this. You have some Express app, you serve up the static middleware. Uh, inside of your HTML somewhere, you have a link to you know, something that is relative to your URL, right? That slash there is significant. And the problem with this is that any change to your front end requires a server change. So you need something like this. And I don't actually mean a low orbit ion cannon of some sorts, although ion cannons are very useful. Um, it makes using a CDN imperative to get any sort of serverless deployment going because otherwise your assets, your actual code front end assets are associated with your back end project. They're totally coupled, every deployment you deploy both of them. So a simple change would take our old app that has that app.min.js that's relative to our URL and replace it that is something to relative to a CDN. So any of the astute folks in the audience are gonna notice that there's still a problem with this, that any front end change still requires a server change because that URL is still static, right? It is completely unversioned. So what does a versioned asset look like? Well, you could think of something like semantic versioning, which you use every day with Node. You could use that. Another way to think about it is to use some sort of SHA compiled from the asset. And this turns out to be the best way to version your assets because it's almost always unique. It doesn't have to change over time. And it also can be really useful when you're trying to find assets. Like for example, if you have 10 assets and one of them didn't change in between two versions, now you can use the same CDN location, you can use the same cache that exists in your user's browsers. You don't have to change that just because you've incremented the version of your application. So with this in mind, how do we approach serverless deployments? Well, that diagram we had before looks a little bit differently. You push your assets into your CDN, and at some point your app queries something, to say, hey, well, what assets should I serve right now? What should I put in my script and linked tags that exist on the page? And then you ship those down to your customer, and instead of getting those from your server, they're getting them from the CDN. But the real question is, how does the server receive new versions? And that is a great question. Um, to put it in another term, how does your server know to serve this instead of this, or perhaps this, right? What, what actual asset is my front end code? What does that do? Uh, but in order to understand this in sort of a philosophical sense, you know, feel the force, you, you have to know what production means. And there's a lot of things about production, but at the end of the day, most apps on the web end up looking like this. That is, they were beautiful at one point, but you had to ship it. And so, you know, the bird poop piles up over time. And that's fine. A lot of reasons why you're gonna get that sort of stuff is internationalization, 
which introduces a very complex problem. You know, no matter how good your automated build system is, once you introduce a large-scale internationalization process into your application deployment, you are gonna need some sort of visual verification. I don't care how good of a developer you are, you do not speak Tamil. I don't speak Tamil, I don't speak Chinese. You need translators who are gonna go over, do the verification, make sure your translations are correct. You can automate that to a certain extent, but you need some sort of verification process there. So that, by definition, means that you're going to have multiple environments. You're gonna have some dev or test environment that your app lives in for a short period of time, hopefully you know, on the order of minutes or hours, and you're also gonna to need to support some sort of promotion or rollback. So you know, digesting all of this in your head, that means that serverless front-end deployments requires an external service knowing what versions should be running in what environments for any or all locales. So that's a lot to grok, I get it, but we're gonna keep going. Uh, at this point, you might be feeling a little bit like this. Um, and you know, we're, we're getting there. Um, we, are, we are getting there. So let's talk a little bit about NPM, right? So how many people have used NPM here? I mean, everybody should be raising their hands. So what you might not know is that the actual NPM registry was written by this gentleman. Uh, and that exists today uh, in a thing called NPM registry couch app, uh, AKA this thing that I hacked together in a weekend, according to Michael. And he did hack it together in a weekend. I remember when it happened. Um, and that is all running on CouchDB, but that's not super important. What is important is understanding the protocol that it exports. And the best source for that is actually still in that document. So what you have here is the rewrites for the CouchDB app. So you'll notice that there are things like slash colon package, slash attachment. That's how you fetch attachments for NPM today, right? You would go and say get I don't know, my module slash dash slash you know, 1.2.3.tgz, and you'll fetch that asset. That's how that works. So if you're looking for good documentation on how the wire protocol works, the NPM registry couch app is still probably the best documentation out there. That rewrites file today is still the gospel, is still how NPM works. I haven't found a better source of documentation. You can also try it out yourself, um, so if you run this, npm c set log level info. Um, you might want to turn off your spinner because it's gonna be a lot of output. You'll be able to see all the HTTP requests that npm is making behind the scenes. So to walk you through a few of those, you know, if you write npm view package, that's gonna call get package. If you run npm view package at version, you're gonna get package at version. Uh, if you do npm pack package, that'll actually download the tarball for you. Um, so that's gonna fetch the attachment. You can also use dist tag, which I don't think most people are familiar with. Anyone familiar with dist tag? Raise your hand. Okay, that's about what I expected. Um, NPM dist tag is a very underutilized feature of NPM. So every time you publish something to NPM, that becomes the dist tag of latest. And when you try to install something from NPM, it goes and it tries to install the latest dist tag. So if you have any, say you're gonna install React CLI or Ember CLI globally, it's gonna always install the latest dist tag. So NPM themselves, they actually have multiple dist tags for their deployments, uh, or I should say versions. They have three dash latest, four dash latest, two dash latest, and that's how they manage multiple trees. You can think of them sort of like, I don't know, git tags or git branches. It's not a perfect analogy, but it's a good way to think about it. And that is probably the most complicated URL that exists there. There's also, of course, npm publish, which is just a put. But what's inside the put is what's actually most interesting. Because when you dig underneath the covers, the npm publish payload, which you can view yourself if you wanna understand it a little bit more by installing this thing called registry echo. I'll let anybody who's interested go and visit that page and check it out. You will see something like this. So this is an actual publish. This is a test publish that I did the other day just to make sure that all of this was still the same and the correct. And so you'll notice that you know, there's the name of my package, test-publish03, which is the same as the name, 
has a description. It has a disk tag of latest, which is the same version that I'm publishing. Inside of that, there is a versions object, which has only one version, one and always one, that's getting deployed. Um, and that has the same version, which has some duplicated information there. It has all the other things that you'd expect, you know, the author, the scripts, um, the truncated readme. But it also has some really interesting meta properties. So if you're running npm publish inside of a git directory, it gives you the git head. So that SHA is included every time that a publish comes to you. It also includes the entire asset. So down there at the bottom where it says big base64 tarball, that's the actual tarball that's getting published to npm. It all gets included in one JSON document. This makes this an incredibly useful deployment tool if you wanted to do things with this. So what can we do with this? You know, how can we turn this into an assembly line of things that become a pretty useful developer workflow? So let's suppose that you wanted to build something, right? Going back to what we talked about before, you need to think about rollback. You need to think about new environments. You need to think about triggering builds. So all of these things can be modeled as individual NPM commands. So if you want to trigger a new build, you can NPM publish. If you want to promote or roll back a build, you can disk tag. Right? So let's say that I wanted to put my module at version 1.2.3 into production. I could run npm disk tag my module at 1.2.3 prod. And that will add the disk tag of prod to my module. Lastly, if I wanted to see what builds were in what environments to make sure that you know, 1.2.3 was in production but 1.4.0 was in test because we're going to deploy that tomorrow, I can run npm disk tag ls. Everybody got it? <coughs> Workflow makes sense? OK. So that's what we've built. Uh, so this project, Warehouse AI, enables serverless deploys of your front end code by providing automated builds pushed to any S3 compatible CDN through that NPM workflow that we just talked about. So what does this look like underneath the covers to talk about real software? It looks a little bit like this. So Warehouse is an NPM published proxy, which means that it receives all your publishes. You publish to it. It then will put that into any NPM registry behind the scenes. So it is not a private registry. It is a proxy to a registry. Uh, it then triggers a build for your asset that you wanted to publish. And it will trigger that in any locales that you've configured. So at GoDaddy, we run about, I don't know, 500 builds a day using this. Um, it, we have to build in, I think, 38 locales. So every time we push something out, there's 38 builds that are triggered. A lot of that has to do with how ECMA 402 works. If anybody wants to talk a little bit about that afterwards. ECMA 402 is the INTL object, if you've ever used that in JavaScript. There's an actual specification for that separate from TC39. So this exists today. You can go try it out. Um, I think it should be live now. Um, and I think I'm a little bit under, but we can take some QA. Great, Charlie. Thank you very much. So if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. We have plenty of time for those. OK. Brad's a plan. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, so can you just talk about what it's going to take to deploy out Warehouse for a second? Sure. So uh, it's backed by Cassandra. <clears throat> so if you haven't run Cassandra, it's a little bit tricky. But that's one of the things that's on our roadmap is to make it work with LevelDB. Um, because the way that we're indexing all these files is actually really not tied to Cassandra. It just happens to be the database backend that we run. We store metadata about your packages that are running in what locales, things about your disk tags, things about the actual build assets. Beyond that, though, it's running a couple of services. There's three services to run, uh, one more than the diagram I had back there. They spin up pretty quickly. We literally just put this out today, so getting it to run easily for folks like you in the audience is probably our top priority as an open source project. So if you have problems running it, we want to hear about it. We want to make that easier. Any other question? Here, OK. So it seems like it might be possible for um, 
for your server version and your JavaScript versions to have some kind of coupling. Like, let's say if you bootstrap data from uh, from the server version onto the page for to be available for the JavaScript right away. Um, is there ever a scenario that you guys have had to deal with where you have to roll back um, your server to a specific version, and that also requires kind of matching that version to particular JavaScript assets? We haven't, but we've, we've theorized about this a lot. I mean, most front-end apps, you want to be a little bit defensive. Like, if you're going to make a breaking server change, you want to be a little bit defensive, like just sort of play with both, see what's available. Um, if you approach it that way, that coupling is pretty easy to avoid. Um, if you have to deploy your old server, you know, you're going to maybe potentially have a one to two minute window where things could be a little bit weird, but things are going to be a little bit weird anyway because of how the, your CDN is going to cache your assets. So, you know, the actual HTML page that's going to get served down to your users is going to have some sort of cache associated with it. So things, by definition, even if you weren't using the system, could be out of sync for a few minutes. Have you integrated this with uh, A-B testing, and how would that look like? Uh, we have not. Um, we do A-B testing a little bit differently. We have another system that this is a part of that does that. Um, if you wanted to A-B in this, there's some th stuff we're thinking about doing. Um, so instead of just locales being the only type of variation you could do for your asset, you could also programmatically define other types of variations, like color sets or things like that. So if that's something that's interesting, I'd love to talk to you more about it later. More questions? No? Since we're good. So thank you very much, Charlie. So it is a break right now. You can pass by the Solutions Showcase. And see you later for the next sessions. Thank you very much.